Hi, everyone. I am here with Michael Del Castillo. And of course, talking crypto, we're talking NFTs today, yes. Michael. And let's just start with the lay of the land. It seems like we're not quite as smitten with them as we've been. We are not. Um, and by we, I mean the market. Um, as always, I do not invest. I do not have any NFTs. Uh, but it's Nor a, do I. It's a good time to be talking about the market's reaction to NFTs because it is almost exactly the one year anniversary of the NFT top. Oh. Um, January 2022, NFT volume was at an all-time high of $4.8 billion. Now, January this year isn't quite over yet, but it's down to $233 million. Wow. The last complete month, uh, December, was $283 million. So um it, the the trajectory would indicate that we're we're going to be looking at ending at around 280 300 million dollars so this month. it's a reflection of enthusiasm is it also a reflection of the volume are, are there fewer nfts that are being so, issued right great now great question no. no 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 in fact quite the opposite um i was just listening into some nft podcast to kind of like test the temperature out there and see how investors were feeling and talking and on a weekly basis, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 NFT packages are dropped. Uh, so it could be that it's become less precious, right? I mean, almost like yes. the price of bananas. The more there are, the cheaper. The, is, is that what's going on? Uh, I think it's a combination. Definitely, they become less precious. Um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of let the analysts say if the market is saturated or not. Um, but I, I, I think that it's fair to say that they're, 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 they are less desirable. Um, but it's not necessarily just because of market saturation. I think there's something more complex going on here about the the old proverbial hype cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and we were at peak hype cycle one year ago, almost today. Um, and we are now deeply and firmly planted in the so-called trough of uh, mm -hmm. disillusion. Um, and this trough of disillusion um, is terrifying to investors. Uh, I, I will say I have to give my, my hat tip to some of the podcasters I was listening to today um, that seem to be um, keeping a, a, a positive spirit and like a big picture perspective on the trajectory. But um, the, the fact of the matter is that people aren't buying these. When they are buying them, they're buying them for a lot less. Um, and there is skepticism rampant uh, outside of the NFT community. Um, this, the inside the NFT community, it feels a little surreal. Um, these, these communities are real communities, which I think cannot be underestimated for the folks on the outside. Some of these groups have 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 people. Um, they're buying and selling NFTs with each other. Uh, they're, um, creating actual products. They're licensing them to make TV shows, uh, open restaurants. Uh, they're going to parties that you can't get in without NFTs. Um, and they, they seem to be having a lot of fun. Um, but it's more it, fun when you make money. Yeah. They also well, joke very easily about how much they're all losing money. Well, let me, let's talk about the use case, yeah. because if we go back a year ago, one of the use cases of NFTs was the metaverse, yeah. and which is, so there's a certain degree of overlap in terms of why would one buy an NFT other than as an investment? Has the value proposition shifted? Um, I would say that the simple answer is no, okay. um, but that's because I think the value proposition is still very, very, very new. Um, and on, on the most abstract level, the way I like to think about NFTs um, is the ability to prove that a digital object, any digital object, is in one place. It's yours. Without needing to rely on a third party. The, the original uh, value proposition of Bitcoin was something similar. The ability to prove that a digital object was only in one place at a time. It seems very uh, rudimentary. Um, but the fact of the matter is that that ability is what lets value accrue to these digital objects. If you can't prove with certainty that those objects are only in one place, then the free market can't ever value them. So whether or not the free market is accurate or not is a completely separate story. But that, that technical ability is step one. Now, 
Bitcoin is what's considered a fungible token. Theoretically, every Bitcoin is the same, though there are some skeptics that would say that the provenance of a Bitcoin, i.e. if it came from uh, a, a, a black market, etc., might lower the value of it a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, and, and, and these NFTs are called non-fungible tokens, and they could theoretically do this same phenomenon of being able to prove that a digital object is only in one place at a time to any digital object, right? Like the value of money is that every dollar is worth the same as any other right. dollar. The dollar right. value of Bitcoin is that every Bitcoin is worth the same as every other Bitcoin. But the value of the deed to my home is that it's different than every other deed. The value or of your my, Justin Bieber NFT. Or your Justin Bieber NFT. So uh, needless to say, it was a little easier um, technically uh, to create NFTs that were JPEGs. Mm -hmm. So that was application one, right? Um, and we saw uh, immense excitement uh, percolate over in late 2020, early 2021, um, as a 60 min $69 million auction of a work of art by Beeple uh, was mm -hmm. put underway, um, as a $21 million auction of um, uh, uh, Bored Apes was put underway. We can maybe talk about that yeah, later. Yeah, Bored Apes, certainly um, in the news. And uh, the, but the novelty wore off. Um, and I think unlike Bitcoin, which uh, at least ostensibly disrupted the ability to create money and therefore some of uh, some financial infrastructure. Um, NFTs were and are disrupting cultural components, right? What um, is it disrupting? I think that's one of the questions I have because obviously, you know, arguably like when, when um, a lot of these art museums went online, they actually saw an increase in the volume of people going to see the real thing. What is, what is it that the NFT, what need are they filling in the marketplace other than of course, you know, authenticating ownership? Is that part of the issue is they haven't really sort of discovered the problem they're solving yet? Well, to use the word disruption in the most literal sense, um, there, there's an example that happened recently that I think really demonstrates the point of, of you know, cultural disruption. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dungeons and Dragons, the, the board game with the multi-sided dice that uh, a lot of folks grew up playing um, and, you know, uh, kind of paved the way for a lot of online video games, has an incredibly loyal user base. Mm -hmm. These people have been collecting their Dungeons & Dragons parts um, for decades. Some of them inherited them from their parents. Uh, the creators of Dungeons & Dragons has a very open uh, intellectual property policy where they've basically let their fans host podcasts about the game, uh, do videos about the game. Yeah, it's like public domain. Almost, yeah, they, they've yeah. kind of created an environment where they're fans that looks a lot like public domain. Um, and then NFTs came along and the creators of Dungeons and Dragons wanted to get in on that game, no pun intended, uh, and had proposed changing the intellectual property structure that had been in place for years. Uh, to sort of reflect this new digital reality. Um, they had included uh, some of the new technical abilities that NFTs enable, like royalty payments that move with the object. So thereby alienating a, their core fan base. All, yeah, these, these uh, changes were going to impact all of those old deals, all of that old intellectual property uh, that had been around for a long, long time and had helped create so much loyalty at Dungeons and Dragons uh, was was at risk. And the uh, what 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 I imagine they expected was going to be met with a lot of enthusiasm um, ended up being completely destroyed on social media well, because it perhaps comes off as greed, right? So so I think it's interesting when you look at let's take the Nat Nat Geo as an example. Yeah. Um, walk us through that one a bit, and because we've got. One of the backlash may be greed. There are other yeah. factors as to why people are saying, mm, I don't think so. Yeah, you know, I honestly, I think the, the Nat Geo one, um, I understand. So just as a quick little uh, backup there. So National Geographic um, had 
uh, launched a program whereby their, uh, again, generationally famous photographers um, whose, we'll just call it artwork, had been appreciated for generations. I think they were founded in like 1877. Yeah. And they were really known for their images and getting places that no one had ever been before and showing you. Well, those photographers, they got paid once uh, and then they went on. Um, especially now where photography is kind of being commoditized now that everyone has a camera in their right. pocket. Um, these photographers, are, they have difficulty earning a living. Um, and I think National Geographic really thought they were doing something cool, right? They had created this program where some of their top photographers' photographs um, could be minted as limited or quasi-limited edition NFTs. And you could buy a digital print of a photograph from one of National Geographic's photographers. Um, I, I don't know all the details about how exactly the funds were broken out, um, but it was definitely intended to support the photographers. Um, and the backlash was just tremendous. Um, I, you know, on, on different grounds than Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I mean, it was very, um, it was very two dimensional. Honestly, mm -hmm. the attacks were not so sophisticated. Um, the social media attacks felt very knee jerk, gut reaction stuff. People were calling it a scam. People were calling it a fraud. People were saying the bubble had popped. Um, and indeed, as we talked about at the beginning, you know, the price of uh, NFTs and the, the volume of NFTs per month, I should say. Um, has dropped so much that it looks like a bubble pop. And I would say, in fact, was a bubble pop. So, but, but okay, go ahead. But, sorry, um, NFTs are just a couple of years old. Um, the oldest NFTs, which were barely in circulation, I think were like 2017. Um, they were minted on the Bitcoin blockchain, and we don't really talk about those much anymore. But like all of this next generation stuff we're talking about is brand new. Um, it feels a lot to me as somebody that wrote my first Bitcoin article in 2011, like what people were saying about Bitcoin. Oh, in back when you could buy a burger with a Bitcoin. Yeah, back when you you could buy a burger with a Bitcoin. Back when you could buy a pizza for what amounts to five million dollars worth of Bitcoins today. So it sounds like an incredible buying opportunity. You're talking about back when it was like a buck, basically. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that technologically, um, we are at a similar place with NFTs that we were with Bitcoin when I first started writing. Which is to say that, like, um, yeah, a lot of people lost a lot of money that were buying Bitcoin in those early days. A lot of people um, made a lot of money that were buying Bitcoin in those early days. But... I think that it's safe to say now that Bitcoin is kind of safely floating at around $20,000 that the question of whether or not it's a scam or not seems to be answering itself. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we're seeing uh, a dramatic rise in traditional financial institutions that are providing a wide range of products for Bitcoin. So I think like what you were seeing on um, social media against National Geographic, these sort of like pithy, not even pithy sometimes, sometimes rather uh, um, uh, troglodytic one-liners, like it's a scam, um, come out kind of two-dimensional. And I think um, underestimate the, the potential to connect these artists that were previously disconnected uh, from their own artwork to, to a new means of making money. But that, that's all said with the Im Im important caution that, like, if you took, like, I, Vivian Meyer uh, was a, a famous, famous photographer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know for sure what her photographs sell for, but I don't think they're selling for $40,000 each. I don't think they're selling for $50,000. No, no photograph really sells for that no much. no so like you're gonna go spend a hundred thousand dollars on a digital nft because you think that it might be worth that much like compare that to the analog and ask yourself if maybe you're participating in bubble market structures and i think the answer is is probably well, yes you have to think there's bubbles and then there's trough and and when we're comparing um the current situation to one dollar bitcoin that would suggest that there's upside from here, are you starting to see signs of that? And what does that start to look like in terms of 
a rational increase in so, the market? So, great question. Um, first, I, I do think it's worth noting that Ethereum, the cryptocurrency that powers the uh, Ethereum blockchain, that many of these uh, NFTs are, are minted on, is up 30% over the last month. Mm -hmm. um, this is at a time when just a month ago, everyone was talking about the death of the industry yet again. Um, since that happened, uh, Bitcoin has recovered to the tune of 30%. Now, there's not necessarily a direct correlation between the price of the asset, of the, I'm sorry, the underlying digital currency that uh, functions as gas to move these um, NFTs. Uh, but I think it does reflect a little bit the, the changing um, understanding of this technology in the market. Now, to answer your, your actual question about the future of NFTs themselves, not the underlying mm -hmm. cryptocurrency, um, I personally would not be looking um, to uh, the, 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 the NFT JPEG that we're mm -hmm. seeing today. Like, sure, whatever, like, they're going to exist. Some of those first-generation NFTs are are probably going to have some historic value and you know may, may go up in price. Um, there's going to be some amazing innovation built on the back of these, these technologies um, that let people do stuff that they never really thought of before, like uh, the, an, an, an NFT as a membership card, you know, an NFT as a driver's license, that sort of a thing. Taylor Swift uh, concert ticket. NFT as a concert ticket. NFT as an album is another one that I find very interesting. Um, but what I what I really think when we're talking about the upside of NFTs, I think we should kind of like try and divorce our thinking from from images. Right. So right? the art world is just one use case, yeah. and that's where we've seen the greatest you know amount of perhaps disillusionment. You've got um, the small independent artists. You've also got a lot of these corporations that are looking at NFTs. Yeah. When you look at these different buckets, are there areas where, in essence, we've just talked about the corporate use case. Is that where we're not seeing trading per se, but certainly value and authenticity and, and cybersecurity concerns being addressed that way? Is that really where I think the action is going to be? Interesting. So I, it, it makes me think of, the question makes me think of your earlier comment about um, some of the early use of NFTs in the metaverse. Um, uh, to, to quickly define that, um, I think, you know, when I think of the, the metaverse, first of all, it's many metaverses. Yes, true. Um, Mark second Zuckerberg all, does not have the only... Correct. Right, and footprint. there is, in fact, a good argument that what he has built isn't a metaverse at all, which we can get to later if you want. Um, but the, the simplest way to think of it is virtual reality, which has been around for a generation or two, mm -hmm. um, real crappy uh, until pretty recently, but virtual reality is not a new technology. Mm -hmm. um, what makes, to, in, in my mind, what makes the metaverse different from the virtual reality that's been around forever is that it's open source. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about a metaverse built on a public blockchain, I mean, it's a, it's a virtual world um, of varying degrees of sophistication, some are very rudimentary, um, that anybody can build on that anybody can buy into, um, that companies can leverage without having to ask for permission. Um, this is not what Mark Zuckerberg is building at Meta. Meta is a very permissioned version of a metaverse. Um, love it or hate it, uh, it is not open source. Um, and it is very different than these more open versions of metaverses. Now, companies have really gotten into that. Um, we're, we're seeing um, fashion designers, um, uh, creating digital handbags that their virtual avatars can carry Reminds with them in Reminds me of Second worlds. Life. From... It's a lot like Second Life, except Second Life was, again, a permissioned right. system, right? Now, there there were some folks like the... Um, uh, how do I put this? Um, complicated character Brock Pierce mm -hmm. um, made his, his, his early fortune on um, selling uh, digital goods... Um, on Second Life uh, that people hadn't necessarily earned but could buy. Um, even that itself was somewhat controversial because um, these goods were technically owned by the company that created them. Um, and in, in this new metaverse, you can have that same kind of Second Life um, digital goods um, properties 
but without having to rely on a third party to give you permission to, to, to do what you want to do with them. So companies are creating virtual goods for virtual avatars that live in these virtual worlds and go around and put on sunglasses right. created by Prada, or I'm just making that up. Sorry, Prada, if you didn't do <laughs> that. Um, and and the, 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 the promise there um, that is really seems to be catching steam. American Eagle just did something recently as well. Uh, it, it seems to be a fundamentally a marketing play, um, which is interesting because it, it might be the, 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 the first or at least the highest profile example of technology being adopted by marketers first so aggressively. Like, it, it makes me wonder, like, how many people are going to want to go into these metaverses if they walk in and they're just like in it's a like giant a mall. virtual shopping mall. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it, let me let me step back a second and put in different hats. Okay. So let's say my first hat is I am an investor. Let's say I bought in the bubble, you know, and I got now I'm sitting here much like with Mike say crypto account saying, you know, is there hope? What what does one do in this situation? Just wait it out. Uh, I love that question. Um, it, it goes back to, I think, some of the early core ethos of uh, Bitcoin itself. Um, there, there was this thinking that the cool thing about having a cryptocurrency or a currency at all that hadn't been created by a government or a central bank um, was that and that was open source, was that the people that owned it would have a built-in incentive to improve it, mm -hmm. right? Like if you have a million dollars worth of Bitcoin and you want to see it grow to $2 million, um, you could just learn how to write software that leveraged Bitcoin and you could build a company that could hopefully create value. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I think a lot of that has kind of been lost, the hodl mentality of people that buy the cryptocurrency and don't do anything with it. It's kind of like sit on it and hope to get rich. Just, like, yeah. that's fine. You know, I mean, like we're Forbes. It's okay something. if you just want right. to get rich. But like the original ethos was that like if you owned it, you would be incentivized to like improve it. And that's, I think, very much becoming true in the world of NFTs. If you have, this is not investment advice. This is not life advice. But I think it is worth thinking about. If you own an NFT of a character that you bought because you thought it was a cool looking character or somehow captured something else about the artistic world that you found interesting, like write a story about it. Make a podcast bring about some, it. Bring some attention to your character. Make it real. You know, like you, you, you don't have to wait for somebody else to go do something that gives value to your asset. Like, you can you can do that yourself. Now that said, with the, the, the huge caveat that the 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 intellectual property ownership of these assets is uh, in almost every case very much up in the air. Um, there was a false it's like a I, promissory note almost. There was a yeah yeah it, it is there the, in 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 most instances, but not because it had to be that way, because it was early. Right. So I think the the assumption when the first generation of NFTs came out was that when you bought them, you also bought the intellectual property. That was a complete misunderstanding of intellectual property law by either the creators, the purchasers or both. It's like um, a limited edition. Essentially, you're being issued. A, you know, we promised you we're not going to give out more of these. Or like if you buy um, uh, uh, a Picasso, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean you have bought the right to make a, a million posters of that Picasso. Right. You know, you might not have the intellectual property rights to, to commoditize that asset in that way. So, that may still be owned by a trust or the artist. And in these, these um, in, in with NFTs, that same was true, where uh, people thought they were buying the right to reproduce it or to do other stuff. And like a closer inspection of intellectual property loss said that that wasn't actually the case. And I think a lot of NFT creators didn't realize that. It wasn't malice. They thought they were giving IP ownership to the owners, and they weren't. And we're now seeing um, licenses that are being created where 
um, the the actual IP owners are letting the NFT owners do all kinds of fun stuff with it. And are those more valuable? Are we seeing that actual value being baked into those NFTs? Where yes, but with a caveat. So the um, companies that have decided to uh, basically open source intellectual property of their NFTs that they've created are, are the same companies that I was talking about that are seeing restaurants opened around a particular NFT character. Mm -hmm or um, television shows, cartoons being created around the particular character. Um, and that value theoretically accrues back to other similar NFTs and that company creator um, by creating increased visibility of that, that character. Um, but the simple fact that it is, that it is the NFT creators to give away or not give away shows that like you haven't you still haven't really bought well, the ownership so the second hat then being the creators um again not necessarily issuing advice but are we we're in a position right now where they're looking at the marketplace is it really to be looking at what's happening in the regulatory environment and understanding why there's been this backlash a little bit of that yeah um i do think that you know, I, I, I'd, I'd love to point people to a report. I, you know, I don't like plug-in companies, but Galaxy Digital did an awesome report at the end of last year um, where they basically did a point-by-point -point analysis of the intellectual property status of like pretty much all of the major mm -hmm. uh, NFT creators. And n none of them had completely given away intellectual property to the NFT owners. And only one of them had like kind of made some inroads there. Um, so first of all, I think it is it is incumbent uh, upon the um, the creators themselves to be a little more transparent about what exactly they've done and what exactly you've bought. But there is going to come a time where the innovation of the technology itself runs up against a wall that is the current state of intellectual property law. And very, very likely that is going to have to be rewritten in some way to accommodate this. Well, this much new like kind the crypto asset. space, right? I mean, we've seen we've seen the regulatory push from a much bigger, you know, SEC, et cetera. Um, but it seems this is much more on still a very um, granular level. It's almost between you and your lawyers, opposed to anybody in Washington saying we yeah. must do something about yeah. this. Yeah, it, it does. It does kind of feel that way. Um, I think that there's uh, similar to in the early early days of uh, cryptocurrency. There's a lot of onus and responsibility on the project creators. Now, let that be a lesson learned too, because so many of those project creators ended up being frauds. Uh, so many of them took money in exchange for uh, initial coin offering tokens, which were essentially IPO stakes, uh, and then didn't build anything. And so these folks that had hoped that the, the value of their asset would appreciate with the creation of the new technology were left with a bunch of useless assets. Um, now, regulators are clamping down uh, on the crypto side. Um, and we are seeing evidence that there is some early exploration on the NFT application. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of a Department of Justice uh, report that was published last year um, where the U.S. government was definitely looking to understand what's going on there and trying to see if they had a place and what that place might be. Has anybody been in the crosshairs? I know Sam Bankman yeah. Freed was in this space. I don't know if that's a factor. Yeah, there's been a lot of people in the crosshairs. Um, in fact, all you have to do is a, a quick Google search for um, NFT fraud or NFT arrests or um, NFT Department of Justice, if you want to be really clear. <laughs> and you can find uh, a, a ream of press releases about recent legal actions that have been taken mostly against the creators of NFTs that have done what's called a rug pull, which is very similar to an ICO where the team uh, raised a bunch of capital selling these NFTs with the promise that something cool was going to happen um, and then didn't really make that cool thing so, happen. So after, you know, winter usually comes spring. And, and I, what are the, I, the signs you would be looking for? Either the red flags of the players that we've just talked about or um, the signals that perhaps the market's going to normalize again, assuming that this trough is not the new normal? Um, that's a good question. I, I, 
I think it really goes back to whether or not there is any actual value being created around these, um, I will call them old fashioned NFTs, which are basically the JPEG version of these NFTs. Mm -hmm. um, if, if there is going to be a recovery, um, the owners of these NFTs are going to have to feel rewarded by their ownership of these assets. Um, right now, that is largely incumbent on the companies that have created those NFTs. They are the ones who are creating events um, that you can only get into if you have an NFT. They are the ones that are hosting podcasts about these NFTs. And um, the, the real power of open source technology are the network effects of other people being able to do stuff. And right now, we're just not seeing a whole lot of that. It seems to me that, you know, unlike the early days of Bitcoin, where the owners of the cryptocurrency very actively engaged and contributing code and building companies mm -hmm. and, you know, really making Bitcoin more than it was, 99% of the NFT owners today are just looking to sit on it and let someone else create that value. So I just, I don't see, you know, many of these projects coming out of the current trough. I think that uh, these these folks are going to find that um, the 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 benefits that they're able to bring from even a heavily venture backed company don't even come close to competing what an, the open source community can do. And right now, the open source owners of these NFTs are are doing very very little. Um, so it may be a new wave. Maybe we may be looking for it, much like the dot com bust. You know. There was a new wave of companies that came in with different metrics, different value propositions. So perhaps that's what's or completely going to be. different applications, right? right? Like um, chances are, you know, there's not going to be a whole lot of headlines when the real estate business slowly moves to NFT-based deeds. There's going to be a couple, but like you're not going to see a headline every time a $5 million NFT-based deed changes hands uh, because a home is a home is a home. And moving the back-end process of that to a public distributed ledger isn't quite as sexy as, you know, a, a, a retail-based transition like uh, where, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are making trades every second, right? It's just not the same dynamic. So, when I look to the future of NFTs, I'm not looking to the future of just these NFT-based games, just these NFT-based clubs, which may or may not, not have value. I'm more interested in the other applications of being able to prove that a digital object is only in one place at a time. Triumph of technology. We'll see. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.